present today is entitled, A Quaker Response to Indigenous Issues. And I'd like to begin with Plumstead's land acknowledgement statement. We, the members of Plumstead Friends Meeting, acknowledge that our meeting house is situated on the ancestral lands of Villanova, a territory that saw thousands of years of rich indigenous history before the arrival of William Penn. As we honor those first peoples, we remind ourselves to continue their attitude of respect for this land and to nurture a sacred relationship to it. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, Arla will start our program. And she's been a friend since finding Doylestown meeting at the age of 12. It was a first day school class that planted the seed to work with indigenous justice. The opportunity for that seed to grow finally came for Arla in 2011 during her last four years in Maine. She was the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the first one in the country. She helped develop and present an educational program about why Maine needed a truth commission. She provided ally training to help Euro-American Mainers process their grief upon learning our painful history with indigenous people and to help them decolonize. Arla will explain more about that term in her presentation. When Arla returned to Pennsylvania in 2015, she transferred her membership back to Georgetown and her work continued. This is where she will pick up the story this morning. Immediately following Arla will be Lois Cooter, who's a member of Plymouth Monthly. Lois has served for over 30 years on the Year Meeting Indian Committee, now called the Quaker Fund for Indigenous Communities. This group is dedicated to the supports and funding of initiatives that sustain indigenous communities and preserve indigenous cultural heritage. In its work, the committee considers requests from Native Americans for funds for a variety of interesting cultural, environmental, and economic projects. It also serves as an educational resource for friends who seek to better understand indigenous issues. Despite her long service, Lois feels she's just beginning to understand the complexity of indigenous history and contemporary concerns, and she enjoys the opportunity to continue to learn. Today, Lois will give a very brief overview of the history of the Quaker Fund for Indigenous Communities and its branding work. In the interest of time, uh, please hold your questions until Lois finishes. Um, thank you so much, Carol Ann, for inviting me to be here with all of you today, and also Daph Jones, who's a genius with technology that we have this opportunity to see this. This logo is from the Truth Commission that I was involved with in Maine. So I have to say this location has incredibly special meaning for me because in 1960, I attended the first year of the brand new Plumstead Elementary School, which is now Gaiman, and I missed all the one-room schoolhouses by that one year. This is the logo for the Coalition of Natives and Allies, of which I'm a co-founding member. And I, too, would like to make an acknowledgement for the entire state that we now call Pennsylvania that exists on the unceded tribal lands of the Erie, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, the Muncie, the Shawnee, and the Susquehanna. And as you heard from Carol Ann, it's not enough just to have the land acknowledgement. You need to actually follow up with actions and other pieces of that that you can have in your statement. So I want to start with um, an apology for only being able to touch on the surface of what I want to share with you. And it's going to come in a kind of fire hose fashion, which I apologize for. But my hope is, is that you can go deeper because I have five handouts that go into more depth. So after 30 years in Maine, um, I did return in 2015, rejoined my Doylestown meeting, and was open to how spirit might lead me to continue doing this work. So I started on the Peace and Social Justice Committee, and I gave a program actually at quarterly meeting of this very nature of, of the Native justice issues in 2016. 
And then I continued to talk at Friends School, churches, universities, and the Peace Center. And it was through the Peace Center that I met Donna Van Boyle, who is a Choctaw Cherokee woman who had been fighting the racist Redskins mascot at Neshaminy High School. And I spoke to their school board meeting, but she spoke to them 17 times over a period of years, trying to bring the information to them about the harm of using Native people as mascots. A woman named Lynn Zarkey, who is the executive director of Kidsbridge Tolerance Center in New Jersey, saw me speak, and the two of us received two grants from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities in order to offer this program to teachers and the community. We collaborated with the state-recognized rec tribes in New Jersey, and our goal was to help the non-Native community understand our history and why the mascots need to change. We shared this program with a wide range of venues, and Pastor John Norwood, who is Nantico Plena Lenape, was our consultant. Then, in 2019, um, in Harrisburg, Donna Van Boyle, Linda Zarki, and I, and some others, attended the final hearing in Harrisburg of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, and they were going to rule on that Neshaminy mascot. This was before George Floyd. So, Still, we were pretty shocked when they ruled that the school could keep the name, but they had to stop using the imagery and that they should educate their community on Native American history. So Nishamani appealed it, and they still have their mascot. And by the way, the school district has spent approximately $500,000 on law lawyer's fees to keep that mascot. This was the impetus for the creation of the Coalition of Natives and Allies. We're five women, three Native, two non-Native, and we work to educate communities on why this practice of using Native people for sports mascots is so harmful, and we also support school districts who are making the change. We have been working with Pennsylvania State Representative Chris Rabb, who's on the far left, um, on legislation so Pennsylvania can join 11 other states in outlawing Native mascots. The program that I had been teaching now is expanded to include all the voices in the coalition, including Donna's 11-year struggle with Neshaminy School District, but also the story of our member, Ramona, who is Mohawk, whose grandfather was taken to the residential school in Canada. He was six years old, he's the one in the middle there, and he was held until he was 18. When he got out, his, both his parents had already died. He was very badly abused while he was there. Ramona took that picture of him on the right when she was in college and he was 95. So the boarding schools morphed into adoption programs and foster care in the 50s and in the 60s, one in three Native children were still being taken and it was dubbed the 60s scoop. I find this an incredibly powerful image. The parents are standing there behind them. So um, Kelly Bova, who is our Dakota member, was one of these children. She was adopted at three months and raised by a couple in Glenside, Pennsylvania. At the age of 50, Kelly found her family, and she's the eighth of nine siblings. She had nine years with her mother before her mother passed away last year. So CNA has given our educational program to a wide range of different groups, human relations commissions, universities, colleges, the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education, elementary, middle, high schools, and faith communities. We've turned our presentation into a film. It's entitled Native Women and Allies Speak, What You Weren't Taught in School. And we had our premiere showing at a conference at Haverford College in June. To decolonize is to relinquish control of a subjugated people or area. For us, it means to decolonize our minds, our thinking, our attitudes, and that we are superior and that we have the best solutions. To decolonize is to de-center whiteness and Western thought. It is to challenge colonial systems. We need to understand that colonial thinking is still going on. This is a extreme social media reaction to the attempt to decolonize sports logos. All of these Native people are working to change and asking non-Natives to examine their ideas about Indigenous people and culture. I'm sorry to say Donna is in the front on the bottom right. 
So how do we become good allies? Ally is a verb, not a noun. Allyship is active support for the rights of a minority or a marginalized group without being a member of that group. Allies cannot be self-defined. They must be claimed by the people they seek to ally with. Our indigenous sisters in CNA have identified Lynn and me to act as allies. That is my role today, bringing information they value. Um, these are some helpful steps for allies, um, just a few, um, but there are also some on the information sheet. I have five sheets, if I didn't mention it already, that I want to give to you afterwards. Um, I do want to just emphasize the first one. Educate yourself. Consider your sources and don't accept something just because it makes you feel better. <clears throat> Sometimes the issues are far more complex in the community that we seek to support than we are aware of. So good allyship requires that you know the context and the history. So I'm just going to name a few in this arc of history, and you probably know most of these. So I apologize again, I'm going to sort of speed through it. But how many people know about the doctrine of discovery? Oh good, so we need to know more about that. Um, it is a foundational concept. For this country, 40 years before Columbus even sailed, the popes in Rome were putting out these declarations, doctrines of Christian discovery. And basically what they said is, if you arrive on a foreign land and they're not Christians, then they're enemies of Christ, and you can capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, put them into perpetual slavery, take all their possessions and property. Essentially, they're no more than the deer and the moose that are roaming on the land. And this is a great early example of white privilege. Though you might think that this only influenced our government in the 1800s, in 2005, it was cited in the ruling by the Supreme Court in a case called Cheryl versus the Oneida. They ruled against the Oneida citing the Doctrine of Discovery. So I hope by now everyone is aware of the diaries of Bartolome de las Casas, who was the monk who recorded the atrocities of Columbus and his men. It is a painful and insulting reminder to the indigenous people on this land that he is still venerated. Ending Columbus Day and initiating Indigenous Peoples Day is an act of decolonizing. And in fact, an act of allyship would be to make that happen in your town, or your school, or any organization that you happen to be within. Here's a pretty brutal piece of our history, bounties. Bounties were created literally to get rid of Indians. They existed all over the United States, money for the scalp of an Indian. This, this is the Spencer Phipps Proclamation, which was in New England, and it had a different amount for men, women, and even an amount for children under the age of 12. And for the full price of a man, you had to include genitals for proof. In the 1850s, the California native population was reduced by two thirds in one decade with bounty hunting. Do all sports fans know the barbaric fact for the meaning of the word redskins? Right from the very start, native people were considered savages and not the same as European settlers. <clears throat> Merciless Indian savages is a quote from our Declaration of Independence. A tactic to rid Europeans of any guilt that we might feel in taking away land and killing native people was to dehumanize them. They were not to be seen as equal human beings, but savages, warlike, speaking in tongues and with strange religious ways. And this attitude laid the groundwork for native people being the most heavily legislated against of any group in this country. I'll just name a handful. <clears throat> Civilization Fund Act, Indian Removal Act, Dawes Act, and I just want to say something that Roosevelt, President Roosevelt said about the Dawes Act, that it was the mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. So native people were being assaulted from every angle, and the one thing that would be a lifeline their spiritual practices were outlawed, outlawed in 1882. Although this country was founded on religious freedom, it is evident that the persecutors became, the persecuted became the persecutors. Voting is another area of astounding historical fact. Native people were not given the right to vote until 1954 and not in every state until 1962. 
This becomes particularly outrageous when you consider that Native people served in disproportionately high numbers in every military conflict since the beginning of this country, even helping us win World War I and World War II with the Code Talkers. They died serving a country that denied them the right to vote. One of these survivors is still alive. The Dakota 38 plus two, another little known event. It was the largest mass execution in our country's history ordered by President Abraham Lincoln. It's a lot. So as a white Euro-American whose ancestors came over in the 1600s, learning these truths has brought up intense feelings for me, deep grief and guilt. And I'm mindful that those feelings can create attempts for redemption guilt-driven behaviors, or the white savior syndrome. I have worked to turn those feelings into fuel and use that fuel to create action. And the actions are like teaching this information to other non-native people like I'm doing right now. But, and this is the huge caveat, it needs to be under native direction and leadership. Everything in this talk has been vetted by my indigenous colleagues. Non-Native people can get in trouble because part of our colonial thinking is that we think we know. And we base things on our own perceptions what Native community of what Native communities need. And sometimes we act without all the information because what we are being offered makes us feel forgiven. And as non-Natives, it is our job to teach each other the correct fact-based history. With your handouts, you can all accurately share what you've learned today. And please know that you are all teachers. That is good allyship. So my hope is, is that you also know about this story. Once the United States government got tired of fighting Native people, a Colonel Henry Pratt had an idea. We'll take their children and we'll kill the Indian in them to save the men. The flagship school for all of the United States and Canada is right here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Essentially, Native children were told that they were savages and they had sinned just for being who they were. Just for being who they were. In 1948, the United Nations came up with an extended definition of genocide. Acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And it supports the definition with those examples. Killing members, causing bodily harm, bringing about physical destruction, preventing births, forcibly removing children, which is what our Truth Commission in Maine was about. We must recognize that our government has engaged in all these definitions of genocide. And great harm has resulted from remaining ignorant and silent about these painful facts of our shared history. With the loss of homelands, way of life, means of survival, autonomy, and the massacre of Indian people. The assault to every aspect of their existence created deep wounds to the mind, the body, and the spirit, and experienced a devastating blow when we took their children. These wounds are intergenerational, passed from one generation to the next, and these wounds are still raw today. This tragedy has left Native communities with the highest rate of socioeconomic distress than any other group by far, and it does not reflect who indigenous people are, but what happened to them since first contact and how our government has continued to fail them. This painting illustrates manifest destiny, which is what I was taught right down the road in fifth grade. It's that settlers believed that they were given this land by God. To them, nature was a commodity, theirs for the taking. And this image of the angel belies this underlying savagery of this conquest. We, white Euro-Americans and the descendants of those colonizers, have to face hard truths. And many resist admitting. We took their land. We took their resources. We outlawed their religion. We tried to obliterate their culture. We took their lives. And then we took their children. And still today, after stealing their identity and all these other outrages just mentioned, we replace their identity with caricatures and racial slurs and on top of that, we tell them it is to honor them. Can you see why this is so infuriating? At one time, the Lenape people occupied eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and part of New York and northern Delaware, known as Lenape Hopi. 
All tribal communities of Pennsylvania, including the Lenape, were dispossessed, displaced, or killed in the 1700s. Because of this forced removal of Native people today, there are no state or federally recognized tribes in Pennsylvania. Although there may be individual Lenape descendants, there are no Lenape tribal governments consisting of continuous community since the colonial era, which is required to be recognized as a nation. The Lenape in New Jersey, Delaware, did manage to stay in continuous self-governing communities and for some, hiding within the black church. And today, they have state recognition as a sovereign tribal government who have been documented since the 1800s. The largest population of Lenape peoples today are in several other states, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and also Canada, and they are federally recognized. They mostly use the term Delaware, and they are working hard to preserve their culture and traditions and are continuing to clarify what constitutes authenticity culturally, linguistically, and legally. These federally recognized Lenape have a center in New York City, which is also Lenape Hopi, and have curated an exhibit at the Michener Museum in Doylestown, which is opening on September 9th. Both the NCAI, which is the National Congress of American Indians, and it was founded in 1944, and ASAT, the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes, have created clear guidelines for proving continuous community and governance since colonial times. There has been no group in Pennsylvania that has been able to do that. It undermines the sovereignty and is harmful to those national tribal nations who carry continuous community governance, authentic traditions, ceremonies, and languages for individuals who merely carry some native ancestry to claim that they're a sovereign nation, appoint themselves chiefs, and sign treaties with others. A treaty is actually a nation-to-nation -nation document. Pennsylvania has no state-level commission on Native American affairs, so there's no gatekeeper there to regulate the qualification for state recognition. The state is in the process of creating one with the Lenape diaspora, whose homelands is our Pennsylvania, to have a seat at that table. Attempting to get recognition by holding rallies, getting white people to sign, to sign petitions and treaties is not the correct process. So I received this letter from my friend Paula Palmer. She says, there are conflicts among many indigenous peoples over the issue of tribal identity and sovereignty. These conflicts stem from inconsistent U.S. government policies over the last 250 years. Such conflicts are very intense among different Lenape and Delaware groups right now. Neither the federally recognized tribes nor the state recognized tribes recognize the Lenape people in Pennsylvania as a tribe because the Pennsylvania group has not been able to document continuous governmental structure since colonial times. Individuals in Pennsylvania Lenape group may have Lenape ancestry, but they have not demonstrated a continuous tribal governance structure. She goes on to say, my personal view is that friends in Pennsylvania might enjoy forming friendships with the Pennsylvania Lenape people. But it would be wise to steer clear of endorsing their appeal for state recognition given the opposition of all the federally and state recognized Lenape nations. As friends, we can listen to the different views of Lenape groups, but we are not the people who need to make those decisions. And I would just say that nor do we have a right to do so. And Donna Fan Boyle has said that by doing so, we're taking sides, and it is up to the tribal nations to make those decisions. She asks us to be a good ally to those Lenape who were forcibly removed from their homelands by not taking away their voice. There are criteria, proper procedure, and policy that has been laid out by the Native communities. And Pastor John Norwood, who I mentioned earlier, had told me that the Lenape people in Pennsylvania today, merely having some Native ancestors who were not interrelated, did not deal with one another, or even possibly know each other, for generations of marrying out, does not show continuing history of community. In light of the fact that Native populations have suffered a 95 to 98% depletion since first contact, 
Sovereignty, the inherent authority to self-govern, is pivotal to the culture and future success of those Native American nations, and it is deeply important and it deserves protection. Our job as allies is to really stay out of that process. And I thank you so much for being open and listening to what I have to say today. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to do a, a history of, of Quakers and, and Native peoples, and I'm, I'm not going to be a full history, partly because it's a huge, it's a huge topic. But it's important to go back to, to the beginning, to the removal of Anunnaki from the East and the role of Quakers in that. Quakers, Mennonites, and others fleeing persecution in Europe were eager to establish homelands in the fertile land of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and thousands arrived in the second half of the 17th century and the early 18th century. They far outnumbered the Lenape population that had been decimated by that time by diseases brought by earlier settlers. The Lenape felt William Penn was honest in gifting them for land that would be surveyed for settlers. And the transactions with the Lenape seemed to include assurances that they could live side by side peacefully with those who were building new homes. Uh, that was not to be. Um, the European notion of private property to be owned and fenced off was totally incompatible with the Lenape relationship with land. The clearing of forests, fencing of fields, damming of streams had a major impact on Lenape reliance on hunting and fishing. Lenape had managed forests to maximize game and had their own way of farming. As more settlers moved and arrived, Lenape had no room to prosper as they had before. So as they moved further and further west, there was more and more friction, and the Lenape and settlers clashed over land and land deals. In the second half of the 18th century, friends' contacts with Indian tribes was through individual friends who were concerned with how Indians were being treated throughout all of the colonies. Because of trust built from past relationships, individual friends were often asked by different tribes to serve as observers at treaty negotiations. During the second half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, friends continued to provide a useful presence for treaty negotiations and tried to make sure the Indians were not cheated of their lands. Friends had frequent contact with Indian delegations who came to the Capitol when it was in Philadelphia to present their grievances to the President and Congress. While the location of the Capitol had some temporary homes before moving to Washington, D.C., Friends continued to host and assist indigenous peoples. Lenape, as well as Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, and others, once the, capital, once the capital moved to Washington, D.C. in 1800, Baltimore, near the meeting, uh, took on roles in, in terms of hosting and uh, smoothing things. <coughs> By the end of the 18th century, it was Philadelphia yearly meeting rather than individuals who became engaged with Native people. The first formal Quaker organization for this was called the Friendly Association for Regaining and Preserving Peace with the Indians by Pacific Measures, and that existed from 1758 to 1764. In, in 1796, 95, sorry, <laughs> Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York yearly meetings all established communities committees to address concerns about maintaining peace with Indians and the needs they had for survival. In early minutes, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting Indian Committee called itself the committee appointed for the gradual civilization and Christianization of the Indian natives. And that sort of says it all in terms of our approach. <laughs> the committee appointed for the gradual civilization and Christianization of the Indian natives. Here's a statement from, 19, from 1795. Uh, from Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. The committee appointed by the Yearly Meeting to attend to the growing concern for the welfare of our Indian brethren have seriously considered the important trust devolved upon them, the prosecution of which will ev ev evidently require prudence, patience, and perseverance, its ultimate object under the divine blessing being no less than the temporal and spiritual welfare of some thousands of our fellow men and their posterity. It goes on. Difficulties, however, should not discourage us from the exercise of our Christian duty towards these people when we call to mind that they were the original inhabitants of this land and that they kindly received and made room for our forefathers when they were strangers in it. 
especially as we are settled upon the sea coasts and parts adjacent, enjoying through the bounty of providence and abundance of temporal blessings, where they once lived in ease and plenty, but are now wandering from hill to hill, scarcely able to find subsistence in their former way of life. Circumstances which loudly call for our brotherly assistance to put them in a way to support themselves by agriculture and handicrafts. And it goes on. It is hoped that some sober, well-qualified friends will be drawn to be united with the concern so far as to go among them for the purpose of instructing them in husbandry and useful trades and teaching their children necessary learning that they may be acquainted with the scriptures of truth, improve the principles of Christianity, and become qualified to manage temporal concerns. And it is expected that the committee will find it expedient to erect grist and sawmills, smith shops, and other necessary improvements in some of their villages. So, Quakers were re responding to call. They were responding to calls for assistance from some Native peoples, but not all would welcome our help. Initial work was started in 1796 with the Oneidas, the only Iroquois tribe, to respond favorably to our first friendly overture. Early friends included those familiar with farming, a blacksmith, and women who lived at the mission home and taught housekeeping skills to the women. Farming implements, which the blacksmith kept going, were also made available. After three years, friends felt that the natives could continue to improve on their own. Uh, starting in 1789, friends from several monthly meetings were approved to work with the Seneca at Corn Planters Land in northern Pennsylvania. Again, this was at Corn Planters' invitation. This was useful to the Seneca in some ways, but there was distrust that the Quakers would ask for payment or even steal the best land. A school was established which would move off the Indian land to Chittasasa in 1804. That was an uh, Indian boarding school. And that continued until 1938. In the second half of the 19th century, the Indian Committee reports reveal an ongoing relationship between the Seneca and Friends. When the Seneca wanted aid in negotiation with the government for expertise or expertise in court cases, they turned to Friends. When harvests were bad, Friends raised money. But Friends were people of their time, reflecting their society's prejudices. The Indian Committee's mission was to civilize the natives. Indian leaders who resisted the Western-style elections on the reservation were called backward. Friends urged the Seneca to set up individual ownership of land, allotments. Indian leaders who resisted breaking up the reservation and correctly saw what would happen if they went down that route were again labeled backwards. Reports of this period indicate a one-way communication with friends helping the backward Indians. There's no indication that they learned anything from the Seneca. In the 20th century, friends continued to assist in defending land grabs and help the Seneca fight the construction of the Kinzua Dam that flooded much of the Allegheny Reservation and forced evacuation of Seneca families. That was in the 1960s. We tried, but we couldn't stop it. Um, it would take days of works in the archives of both Swarthmore and Haverford to research the work of the Indian Committee during the 19th century and early 20th century. And we really do need a history. <laughs> uh, but in coming through minutes dating back to the 1970s, I can give an idea of more contemporary work of this group. In the 1970s through the 90s, there was a strong focus upon relationships with Iroquois or Haudenosaunee, with support of the Akwesasne Freedom School, St. Regis Mohawk Reservation, annual travel to present scholarship money for Iroquois students, and in 1994, members of the committee met a request to have PYM presence at the 200th anniversary of the Canandaigua Treaty. Through the 1990s, members of the committee attended meetings of the Associated Committee of Friends on Indian Affairs, held in the Midwest. ACFIA gathered evangelical friends who set up missions and schools for indigenous peoples such as the Choctaw in Alabama, Seneca, Wyandotte, Osage, Kickapoo, Shawnee, and others in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Iowa. We were a bit uncomfortable with the missionary nature of ACFIA, uh, even though Native peoples themselves were centrally involved in, in these endeavors. And those friends who had worked, to, had, who had established direct relationships with, with the ACFIA retired from the Indian Committee, and, and it's, the link was lost. Um, in the 1990s also, we put our attention to more local needs. We established close contact with the United American Indians of the Delaware Valley. 
and financially supported their work and their cultural center in Center City, Philadelphia. This relationship would continue until the group split apart in the 2000s. The committee also supported Native students attending West Town and other Quaker schools in this area and provided scholarships for college students. A constant effort was made by the Indian committee members to learn as much as they could about Native peoples and to, and to reach out to monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings to share resources and organize workshops by committee members or by bringing in Indigenous peoples themselves. Committee members also had, had some timid relationships with the local Lenape communities in, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, but this would be developed much more in the 2000s when we met with Lenape of New Jersey and Delaware State and supported conferences and travel that would bring the Eastern Lenape in contact with the Delaware of the federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. Sadly, this is not happening today. The federally recognized tribes do not recognize the state recognized tribes of New Jersey and Delaware. It fell apart, hopefully it'll come together again. We'll see, they'll have to do that. <laughs> Um, support in both advocacy and granting has spawned a, a spanned a, a wide range over the last five decades, with an emphasis on projects that are initiated and carried carried out by Indigenous peoples uh, for the benefit of their own communities. These have included suicide prevention, youth programs, legal support for land issues, language and cultural <coughs> cultural initiatives, environmental work, and, and traditional farming, media projects to document Native arts and history development of cultural centers and travel by indigenous leaders and youth to, to national gatherings and conferences. Indigenous communities have included not only the, the Haudenosaunee and Lenape, Lenape, Delaware, but also Crow in Montana, Wabanaki in Maine, Lakota, Lakota in North and South Dakota, Navajo in New Mexico, Chickahominy in Virginia, Bumi in the Pacific Northwest, Ojibwa in Minnesota, and Yaki in California, among others not to mention Aymara of Bolivia and indigenous peoples of Mexico. We've supported the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, which involves indigenous people of a number of tribes. We've also developed work with urban communities. Some of the more recent granting has gone to an indigenous permaculture project for urban natives in Oakland, California. In support of a drum group and singers from the Philadelphia-based We Are the Seeds of Culture Spring Social Event support for powwow of the Native, Native House Alliance of Philadelphia, uh, sort of an outgrowth of the earlier United American Indians of the Delaware Valley who socially support Philadelphians of various tribes. A project to develop theater and community knowledge of Taino culture by the Puerto Rican folkloric dance group in Austin, Texas, and travel on the part of members to the Delaware Nation, and travel on the part of members of the Delaware Nation of Moravian Town Ontario to participate in the Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Day at Penn Treaty Park in Philadelphia. This path, this, this coming October, that's October 9th. The committee has worked with and supported projects by the American Friends Service Committee, uh, Friends Committee on National Legislation, and maintained contacts on and off with Baltimore and New York yearly meeting Indian Affairs Committees. Um, besides working to help Friends of PYM learn about Indigenous issues through workshops, in publications, the Indian Committee asked yearly meeting in 2010 to minutes its disavowal and the Doctrine of Discovery and support the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We've been pleased to see the growth of the PYN First Contact Reconciliation Collaborative and work by the Salem Quarter Indian Affairs Committee who have maintained very strong relationships with the Lenape of New Jersey. Uh, there's room for everybody to be working on these things. <laughs> With so much to learn and the diverse indigenous peoples of the America, not to mention the Lenape communities in our area, serving on the, on the Indian Committee now called Quaker Fund for Indigenous Communities, uh, has been challenging and, and rewarding. Newer members in the granting group have been astounded to find how little they know. They're just beginning to learn things. One of them never even knew there were Quaker boarding schools until recently, which is understandable because we were never told about that. After some 40 years serving on the Indian Committee now, now I'm called the Quaker Fund, uh, I'm astounded to discover how much more I have to learn as well. It's, it's endless. I've prepared a resource list which provides links to Quaker organizations, indigenous organizations, 
Delaware Lenape tribes, and some of Philadelphia's indigenous communities. Uh, it's not complete, but it will give if you, if you, you'll, you can spend days and weeks pursuing these links, and it will help you learn a lot about national issues as well as local issues and what's going on out there and the people that are supporting indigenous peoples. One of the most important things friends can do in support of indigenous peoples is to learn who they are, listen and hear what they have to say, and be mindful that they are a very diverse group and they don't always agree with each other, just like us Quakers. <laughs> um, I want to point out two books. This one by John L. Ruth called This Very Ground, This Crooked Affair. This um, is a history of the Mennonites, but very much so of the Quakers and our movement of the Lenape off the land. It's an excellent history of Quaker in uh, Lenape relations. Uh, this one uh, is by uh, friends of the Quake of the Baltimore uh, yearly meeting Indian Affairs Committee. It's called As They Were Led, Quakerly Steps and Missteps Toward Native Justice. And this is from 1795 to 1940. It's, it's, it's good because it really talks about Baltimore, but also Philadelphia and New York and some of the collaboration they had in the early days. Um, there, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting has yet to do a book like this, and this is only this is only up to 1940, so there's there's more to go. I don't know what New York Yearly Meeting is doing. Um, so anyway, I will put the resource material over there on the bench, and you can help yourself to it. There's a sign up sheet that we run out. Of. Thank you. October 9th this year, it is the former Columbus Day. Yes, and part of what that came down was whoever ruled it said there was no indigenous child that stepped forward that was a victim, so we can't say that they were discriminated against. And when they said that in Harrisburg, I said, so you're allowed to use the N-word in the school, even if there's no... African American child who, and, and it, so yeah, there's just a lot of work to do. That's why we're going with the state, because um, Maine wound up getting theirs uh, anti mascot legislation. They were the first ones. And I think that's because the Truth Commission was there too, and we were educating the community. Um, and now there's 11, and we would let Vermont and New York just join. So that's where we're going to do it. And then the Chamonix just going to have no choice. I forgot to mention that I do also have a sign-up sheet for anybody who wants to be on the uh, coalition of Natives and Allies and mailing list. And I just need to let you know it's just me doing constant contacts. So you know you're not going to get inundated. You maybe get one a week tops, but um, that's going to be up on the bench along with the handouts. Sixty sixty-three in Pennsylvania alone. 80 some in New Jersey. There's only one other Redskins, and that's in Sayre, which is up north. And um, yeah, they even said, Nishamani even said when the uh, federal team, um, you know, they, they're the Redskins, and that's our national team. And when they stopped, you know, that was their excuse, but they didn't, they didn't follow through. We, again, well-meaning is, is hard. It, again, that's where constant learning is really important because you need to need to know what not to do. You need like stepping into the middle of that. And I've, I've learned that the hard way by talking to two members of different um, federally recognized tribes in the Delaware and bringing up that, oh, well, what about the New Jersey folks? <laughs> What? Boy, was that an angry response. <laughs> um, so you do need to step back, and you can't know when to step back until you know what you're stepping back from. Um, so, so, so it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to say something stupid. Um, it, it's important to, to listen. It's important to be open. Uh, it's important to, again, work with groups that have been there, done that. 
Um, each each different group that's working there, the, the uh, first first contact record. FCRC, I, I collab, collaborate with them. First Contact Reconciliation Coalition um, mm -hmm. is in Philadelphia yearly meeting. Um, I have a handout from them, from that organization as well. There's a, there, yeah. there's a lot of people that are working on that in terms of guiding you as to how to, how to build an allyship, how to build a respectful relationship. Uh, let's face it, we were, we were never given history and we were clueless right. growing up as kids. We never learned about this stuff. And Quakers have always sort of made William Penn a hero when he really wasn't, wasn't a hero. He had some good things. Yeah, a few good things. Mm -hmm. he had some but Quakers at the time, they were they were interested in grabbing land. They were making deals. They were trying to get get land and get wealthy in some cases. Um, so, it, so it's not it's not a not a great history. Um, I think I I feel positive that friends now are. Sincerely interested in learning all this stuff after maybe ten years ago, you just didn't see that. You didn't see that reaction. You didn't see the level of people wanting to know the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. Uh, and I see that as being very helpful. Very helpful. The, the Quakers are finally owning up to their history, both with the boarding schools and with, with what we did. I could say something about that relationship between the federal and the state. Um, 500 years of genocide has created some very, very tender and protective feelings. And if you've gone that route and you've proven it, you've gotten federal, I can see why there's a very strong identity with that and, and the clout that that has. And also because you're not even in your homeland, and you know there's a lot of feelings I understand with that. But NCAI, which was established in '44, it's very, very well respected. They do create accommodation for how tribes could have stayed in community, self-governing community all that time. And in meeting with the tribes in New Jersey and interviewing them and taking videos, you know, I've heard that one of the ways that they got to hide, to keep their community, but hide was in the African-American church because the census just called them colored and they were able to stay together. So, you know, proving that and bringing the receipts and showing that they were and that they stayed is really hard and it's a lot of work. And that's why I, I so respect those tribes that have done that state proof. I said, how do not sound so serving well, um, there, are, there are a number of organizations that I have on here, the yeah. national ones, um, the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, yeah. a great thing that yes. contributes to. Yes. That's, that's a major one. Um, yeah. The Association on American Indian Affairs, the Native American Rights Fund, um, the National Congress of American Indians. Um, check out their websites. They all welcome contributions, sure. and, and believe me, they, they've been doing good work for a long time. Um, the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is relatively new, but it's still it's, it's doing important work, and it's doing work to heal people that we Quakers damaged. So, <laughs> I would also say the Coalition of Natives and Allies dot dot work. 